human rights or human life? Human rights or human life? When I really think about it, don't you care about human life? There would not be any human life if no human rights. Human rights affect the future more than human life will. Well, you wouldn't have much of a human life if you didn't have any human rights. Indefinitely, I guess I have to bring it up that it does actually come from what we believe creates us around us. If we allow a government, people, to have different rules around us and regulations around us to rule us, then you're kind of giving away the rights that you indiv individually could say. You individually could stand up for. And I think that's what takes away the priority for many people. Like, what's the priority to you? Is the priority having the human life structure where we're built into? Or having your human rights a little more uh, bigger than that? Because in a lot of ways, both really affect us. And human rights affect the future more than human life will. Because there would be no human life if human rights are not our first priority in general. I'm talking about individually too. Because the sad part is most individuals have to fight for their own individual rights. And that not everybody will get it. The only ones that will will be the ones who fight for it, or in some respects, not like fight, re being rebellious, being violent, stuff like that, but you actually have to go all the way with it. As with what we've seen with even the body scanners at the, you know, the TSA, everything that's happened with that, there have been people who have gone to court for it, just as m much as people who are fighting against taxes. When you look at the real, the real, the realistic mentality that we came over here because we didn't want taxation yet we let the tyrants run over here too you know because they say oh it's only implied that we shouldn't tax people well yeah if you can if you can lip sync what something's written on paper you're make you can make easy tyrants you know that's why me banning guns the whole thing that's happening right now it only helps the kind of thing to make them make people in power say, oh, it's just implied that we shouldn't take away people's guns. It's only implied. When it is military issue that they're talking about in the, in the paper itself, but to be honest, you know, the one thing that most, most of the forefathers knew was that the easiest ones to take over is the government. To be tyrannical, very easy to have that kind of government follow because they, they went through all the whole list of civilizations and societies that came before that had tyrannical governments and they still they're still here you know i think that's what makes it easy to call like like something communistic you know the easiest reason to call call a system communistic is to just say they don't go by time but the thing is neither do animals you don't you don't call a lion a communist you don't call a bear a communist they're just animals they don't care about time Time is not, you know, time seems to be a lethal weapon. If you don't believe in it, then you must not believe in the civilization we're living in. No, I don't believe in it because I don't think it far exceeds any sort of vision of life that we can live. You know, I think about day and night. I think about what the cavemen think of because that's what the first thing they were probably exposed to was the, the daylight to nighttime. My God, I bet it was a surprise to see that. I bet it wasn't so easy to deal with either. But to create these kind of self self images and self realities through using the methods of time, you know, I didn't create time, I didn't create race, you know, and I don't think I ever would create race because I think that's one of the one of the worst things you could create. The identity of people through where they've come from and their skin tone and everything else. To create names for that, it already shows a detachment from the humans themselves from humans themselves because if you have to take the time to kind of make an image of each individual from each different place then you're taking the time to regulate how you would look upon that what you would feel upon that because you're creating a moment to say I need to judge this before I get to know it 
You know, that's that's what I think is the easiest mentality and the easiest gain of any image of human rights versus human life. I mean, have a right for an opinion in my life, but you don't have a right to intrude in my life. There's a big difference. Like, um, I kind of think about that with what happened over the years recently with friends. Certain friends didn't agree that I had my opinion. And I think that's what really got them down is that... And I think that's the problem with a lot of people. They assume that everybody's opinion comes from something else, from somebody else. So, like, if I were to believe something, and I can express it so many damn times through Pink Cloud Radio, and describe it to a T that it shows that I individually thought of this, I just have many other people that agree that I've done it in their own ways, that I've taken their sharp senses or use their senses for different things besides the inaction of life, which is to use the script that's been written and continue writing that script. But the problem is there's nowhere to go with that script. There's no end. You know, and that's the thing with, like, with like the one thing I never understood about, like, um... Having a right, you have a right to your opinion, of course. But at the same time, an opinion is just an opinion. So, like, I think about what my grandma has said recently about, like, let's take into account if a lot of the conspiracies are true, and there's, you know, the Illuminati, such like that, on top, in the top position, controlling everything in the world. If that is true, and let's take it from my grandma's perspective of you can't change anything. If this is how it is, you can't change anything. Okay then why are they wasting the time and there's people being killed and there's people committing suicide supposedly which I mean you can make up those stories too you know literally just saying somebody committed suicide doesn't mean they did you know it's just like labeling somebody a child molester easiest way to cop out people in this generation and what has been through my lifetime that I've seen is labeling them a child molester saying they're heavily on drugs you know doing these whole things I don't know them personally. Why should I believe your sources telling me so? And I think that's the issue where we come back to just because that person accepts it, maybe they want it that way too. Sometimes if somebody is said to be heavily on drugs, maybe they'll take that reporter and say yes. The reporter and say yes, it's true. I do take all those drugs. And maybe they never took a drug at all. And I think that's the mentality we've all rung over, is the, you don't even need to worry about killing somebody, you're killing the, the one thing that has built this society is what I just said right now, having a right to an opinion in my life is fine, but don't have a right, you don't have a right to intrude in my life, there's a big difference, because once you give an opinion in my life, that's fine, but once you try, try to intrude in my life, and try to say, this isn't good, I'm going to say this about these people, I'm going to say this about these people, you're worse than the media. You basically have your right to say what you want to me. But once you start saying it to the people that I introduce myself to, that I haven't even taken the time to hurt, to place on you anything, you're basically saying, I'm going to stomp on anything that you try to do in your life. And I think that's the one thing that parents do that you know people's clo the people closest to you can do the the harshest things to you because they want they want you to meet certain kinds of people but why would i want to meet like somebody like what my mom did my mom met the husband she had and i'm not regretting it i'm just saying that if i can learn something to not act that way why isn't that better and i think that's the thing that really counts to a lot of people like my grandma appreciates better somebody who's on drugs, who's a neighbor, who grew up and was very, like, bad, taught uh, taught all the bad things to all the other kids around, and then all of a sudden said, thank you so much for not, for not stopping with me. That's somebody that she respects more rather than her own kids who have been good their entire lives and just want to have individual life experiences on their own. I think that's what really tragically is the problem. Like, every... The one thing about the Matrix movies that I'm going to bring up right now is that people do love misery in that way. They love the debauchery and everything with what Agent Smith said in the first movie to Morpheus that people love when people hurt people because they could see the big vigilance of the character 
reintegration with life. And they could take it with pride. You know, once you can see that somebody has turned out better because of you kept on saying the same things that you said to me, but you didn't need to say to me because, duh, I'm not going to make those same mistakes. But I think that's what really influences people more is if somebody does really bad and you've helped them or you contributed to that sort of change of character. And I think that's that's why we don't have a new wave of people anymore because all we care about is reputation. So if all we care about is what other people think of us and that accolades to what we will, you know, take into our lives, our entire life, we're going to have a boring life. You know, that's why people say, "Oh man, I'm so bored." It's because they listen to everybody else's disapproval. They really love it. They love living in that misery. They, you know, and parents do it the worst. They you know, I'm not going to apologize for that. They do. You know, you have to accept that not your life. This isn't your life. You know, you, and I think everybody's vic- vicarious atonement is to live through somebody else. Sadly, you got to live through yourself. Whether you did something and you accomplished it on your own or you gave up your life to settle in a family, to do things a certain way, you got to have your passion build in that then. If you did what you wanted to do and you kept on trying to do what you wanted to do and you didn't accomplish it, there's always the passion that you have for what you have accomplished and that you have accomplished at all. And if you didn't, you got to find the passion in what you love already. If you can't, then you want somebody else to live through the life that you didn't live through. But, you know, that's that's a regret that no one else can live with. You know, I can't carry everybody else's rock on my back. And I think that's what really comes down to, like, when people intrude in your life and try to give you your their opinion. They're basically saying, live my, your life the way I have. And have failures have no option. You have to experience that failure. Like like, oh no, like my uh, grandfather after the stroke. And Uncle Ray. And w- after his stroke as well, I believe. Uh, what happened to both of them. The ways people phrase failures dignifies the need to not appreciate or respect, but do what is ultimately up to you. And I think that's what happens with that. Like, if... if um, if something bad happens to a family member and you all of a sudden just feel like, oh man, I have no option here, I just have to do this. Like, the way you dignify sacrifice, for example, which failure in a lot of ways can signify the idea of what you have to sacrifice. But the problem is, sacrifice is only bad, failure is only bad if you make what somebody, what happens to somebody else, you. You didn't have the stroke. You didn't have to worry about the millions of money that was taken away from you. And I think that's the problem. A lot of people stem their own self-depreciating qualities on themselves or on others. Or because of what others have happened, well, because of what happened to others. So, it, like me, for example, I can't depreciate my life because my mom ran away on her second marriage for escape. That's fine. She ultimately made that choice. And choice is the problem at that point. But... At the same time, it doesn't mean I have to depreciate my qualities because of how she went through life with that. The one thing that I've learned is that you have to define your qualities based on what you want and based on what you've learned. You know, I learned a lot from my mom because I'm not going to go into a relationship for security or escape. And if everybody else does, maybe that's why I'm alone. You know, some people have asked me, well, why are you alone? I mean, don't you want to be with anybody? Yes, I do. But I want to be with somebody that wants to be with me. Not just to live up to her expectations or because that I'm trying to find escape or security. That's the thing. If all you offer is for me to just live up to your expectations, how do I know that's the only expectations you got? How do I know I'm the only one you want your expectations to be fulfilled with? I don't know that. Now, if we build our expectations together, if we get to know each other, if we hang out, if we take the time, then yes, totally. But if all you're going to do is say, live up to my expectations, I mean, buy a mirror. Don't waste your time getting to know me, because what you truly want is your expectations, not ours. And, you know, that's the one thing when I say that I want to be with somebody to 
to grow our expectations because I want our expectations to grow, not just yours. That'll be like me being a dog in the relationship. Whoa, 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 whoa. I'm not a dog. I I love animals, but I don't think I'd have any because they, they remind me of slaves too much. They do, and I don't. I'm not putting them down or criticizing them, but definitely, I feel more now that a lot of people have animals for those purposes because they can't control something. Oh, this is the best friend I got. The dog right here. The cat right here. Yeah, the best friend you got because they don't talk back. You know, and I think people take it too critically on their own impression of who they are. If somebody says anything about their lives, but that's the one thing about the disapproval I talked about earlier too. Everybody's gonna have an opinion in life. In your life. About your life. Which means... They're only intruding if you let them intrude personally. I didn't. I could care less. Because I know how another person thinks. If you know how a person thinks. Especially within your family or outside of your family. If you've known somebody long enough. At a certain point. It's your fault that you're letting that disapproval. Or what they say about your life. Their opinion about it. If you let them hurt you. You're letting them hurt you. You enjoy that. You enjoy, you know, you know, getting yourself put in the sludge in life because you don't want to take responsibility for your own opinion. You don't want to stand up for that. Because a lot of times it's not about fighting. It's about just accepting what they say, accepting their rationalization of what you have, and just saying, that's not my rationalization, I have my own. Because I think a lot of people like degrade love, for example, with the idea of, well, you have to be rational about it. No, you don't. You have to be rational about shutting up. You you said your opinion. You've had your peace. Now you got to let me live in peace with what I have. But you're going to affect our lives. No, you're affecting mine right now. I don't see me affecting yours. The only reason I'm affecting yours is because I'm not taking your opinion and using it. But you have never used mine, so I'm not doing this out of in consideration or just to get back at you I'm doing this because I personally don't believe that opinion well you're not smart then and see that's the argument the the cycle is being judgmental towards somebody says you're right hey 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 you have to be judgmental yeah towards people for your personal life not towards other people in their personal lives that's their personal lives not yours you don't own them and this is the idea of sheep of things in general within government, if we allow people to control our lives inside our lives, and even if if we as parents, as anybody, try to say, say to our kids that, oh, you know, if we treat them like they're everyone else, then why did we have kids? Why did we have kids to just treat them like everybody else in the world? Why? Why have kids if that's how you want to treat them? I think that's the problem that we have, is that we believe that we have, we could have any ransom point. I mean, that's, you know, a terrorist is simpler. That's what I always say. A terrorist is simpler, at least. At least they're just trying to kill you. But you're not trying to kill me. You're trying to control me. There's a big difference. I'd rather you just try to kill me. And I think that's the thing about failures is that you don't appreciate it and you don't respect what you've done. You just say, oh, it's a failure. And I, I thought about that in my life. Like, let's say I never get published. Let's say all this stuff. Maybe it's not up to me. There are a lot more people that are in powerful positions ever since I was born. Maybe somebody else just doesn't like my writing enough or says, oh, no, what he's speaking about is too open. There's too much of an open mind in that. And seeing that there's a lot of closed minds here, why would they appreciate I want to respect that quality to bring it out to the world. You know, I do it myself, as such, with the Pink Cloud Radio here. But outside of that, we're just sort of descending into whatever we please. Like, and I think that's the deal with a lot of this stuff, is that most of it is just based on what we, you know, accumulate in life. And I don't disagree with that. Most of the music, most of the stuff that I've grown up with, has been a huge, huge improvisation into what I am. But there's, you know, I mean, obviously everything is not an influence. Actually, I would say nothing is an influence. I just think that there's an influence in the juxtaposition of everything that I've used. 
even things that I don't really care for anymore. I mean, I may have Star Wars posters in my room, but I don't think about Star Wars that much. I just have a couple, and, you know, I think about all this stuff and think it has assembled something of who I am, but it's also taken away. It's also taken away because it's taken an image that seems so easy. And I think that's the thing about most of what I'm interested in. There's an easy image in most of this stuff. So it, it's an easy it's an easy thing to use to say like, oh, it's just, you know, bad versus good. No, it's not. It's you versus yourself. <laughs> and I think that goes back to possession of friendship. It helps, it helps me to it helps me to give the boot, you know. It's like intruding, it enforces the whip hand. You know, and I think that's like with what happened recently with my ex last year that after the friendship, after the relationship had gone away, which the whole thing, I'm not going to blame her, but I will say that she still had feelings for her ex. Still was in love. And that's fine. But you can't disregard what you have here, you know. I think the one thing that I've noticed is that a lot of people, they don't like multitasking, but they want you to multitask. And that's one thing that I've learned with a lot of people from my friends before. And I said, fuck you, fuck you. I'm worse at multitasking than you. You're telling me to multitask. I never have. I never did in this whole thing. Even knowing you from the beginning, and you're pushing multitasking onto me? I never did before. How about actually informing me about this? And I think that's the one thing that I've learned about this possession of friendship stuff. Like, because I think that really shows that you have no regard over what an individual is. Like, it wouldn't matter if they told you, stop. They wouldn't. And I think that's the thing about it, like, what the ultimate pres presidents of, like, the opinion. And, and, like, if someone has an opinion about who I am. Like, my ex, for example, called me an asshole one time in the car. I just, you know, shouting at me and saying that, but I just thought, what the, what's the point of this? Because, for one, she obviously didn't, she wanted me to be patient with her, but that wouldn't have mattered. Because she wasn't being patient with me. So, you know, I think that's the one thing that I've learned is that it's very one-sidedness. There's a lot of one-sidedness in this whole thing. And I think that's what really shows what, I'm, what I've said before many times is that I've had one-sided emotions. Well, because no one else wants to ultimately make a connection together. They want you to take the responsibility of what they can't control in their lives. So they give it to you and say, hey, let me see if you can multitask better than I can. Let me see if you could do this better than I can. But they don't tell you. They just, they just put it on you without telling you. And they expect you to understand. Well, I can't understand if you don't tell me and talk to me. And I think that's the ultimate goal of a lot of people in power. They don't need to tell you anything. They just do it and they expect you to have the run of the mill with it. And I think that's what really the possession of friendship is. Like, I don't possess any of my friends. So that would be a waste of time. I wouldn't want to even be their friends then. Because at the end of it, what will ultimately show? Oh, well, you care about me because you said these kind of things about me when I wasn't there. Or whatever, you know. And I think that's what really, that dignifies no response. That's, that I think is one of the worst things you could do to a friend. And that's why I said, that's why I said it helps me to give the boot. Because it helps me to give the boot to the friendship. And it helps me to see like, hey, you know what? I would never treat you like that if you met one of my friends and wanted to be their friend. That would have been fine with me, you know? But if you're going to have to angle yourself around it to try to say that I'm the bad one here, then go ahead. You know, you don't need me here, obviously. And obviously, you don't want me there with your friend. So I got to go. And I think that's what makes it an easy step to me because it's like, if you're not going to stop, what's the point of this? What's the point of talking with you at all? Because... I think the one thing is, is that when you ask somebody the hard questions, if they try to avoid it with saying that, oh, if you don't like what I have to say, then right there it's over. I mean, that's, I think that's the easiest scapegoat in history, is to not deal with something directly. 
You know, and I think that's the one thing. If I offer a solution in an argument and somebody else doesn't want to find a solution, they just want they just want it their way, then bye-bye, you know. That's the main reason of what I said about disapproval. Like if you really care about someone else intruding in your life, then you think they're right. You do. There's there's no way around that. Yes, it's going to be difficult to change your interpretation and to have your own thought. But if you don't fight, if you just say, hey, I feel this way and you're not changing my way of how I feel. That's the point. That's the real point right there. You're not changing how I feel. You're putting yourself in a position of power that you've only thought of recently. And I think that's what really creates what people say is a good fruition of a friendship. Is to develop yourselves and to not just expect something in return. For developing yourself, for talking with a person. Because a lot of people expect a lot just from a little bit that they do. How do you know that's a lot? You know, I think that's the thing. Like a lot of people think, ah, well, I've helped, I've helped them their whole lives. How do you know you did? How do you know they wouldn't have been in a different position now? Yes, they went through a lot of hardships, but saying that you were the only influence in their life, you're basically saying that any mistake they've made, they wouldn't, they they can't learn anything from that, but they can. And I think that's why, like, when people possess a friendship, it enforces the whip hand. It means that they're just trying to be that kind of control, controlling person and controlling kind of stability for everybody. Like, I'm going to be the whip hand here. Well, I wasn't the whip hand before, so why would I deal with your whip hand now? And I think that's what happens ultimately, is that it goes back to not accepting what another person is or what another person finds. Like, like, let's say I'm with a friend, finds love, and we just hang out for a while, even though that person was somebody else with me. Ultimately, it wouldn't matter. It wouldn't matter to me, I mean. In the sense of, I wouldn't have to leave when I see that they found love. Oh, that's great. Or if I was to say that someone else found luxury in their creative writing, got published... I wouldn't feel dis discredited or disregarded because they did and I didn't yet. That wouldn't matter. That would be whole stones backwards. Well, but I need to worry about that. Congratulations, I would say. And I honestly mean that. But if what I'm going to do is just assemble, you know, the reputation of what you are to me, you know, make baggage, baggage, baggage of what I feel about this because I don't have it, then it's like, what's the point? When I get it, I'm not going to be happy then. When I get ha when I get love, when I get published, I wouldn't be happy if I didn't accept or if I rejected every single time I saw it from somebody else, from a friend or from a person I know. Heck, even from a girl I like. If I if I see them find love and I'm like, God damn, I wanted it to be with me. I wouldn't say that. But I'm not going to deny that I didn't have feelings. I'll just say ultimately, um... It's your choice. Yes, choice is the problem, but to be honest, the one thing that's higher than choice that is a problem is possession. The way you act towards somebody else that is in your life has a bigger effect than anything else. You can't, you can't reject somebody else's actions because you think they're trying to be controlling, because you think they're trying to be an authority. Because a lot of times people don't even know how to control their own lives, so... If you're thinking that somebody's trying to control you, think about it a little longer. Because maybe they're not. Maybe the only thing they're doing is being themselves. If that makes you upset, then it's probably better that that friendship ends. I mean, to me, with all my friends, I've been myself. And sometimes I've lost friendships because of that. And that's fine. I didn't lose it right away, which was surprising. Because I talked about almost the exact same things. And then... It ended. And I was like, okay. I mean, if that's your answer to not accept somebody because of that, then it's better off that I left because I wouldn't want to deal with somebody who has that kind of easy snap. Like, I'm going to snap this way because this is what I think you believe. You know, and just kind of calling that judgment of opinion, the possession of a friendship 
it seems a lot harder if you don't accept the differences of your friendship. That I'm not going to be like you. Why would I want to be? Do I want, do I want to have just a mirror of myself in you? Nah. I want to just have you. For who you are, you know? And I think that's my mark reflecting on me, or her, or his mark, that reflect on you. And that's what really is what life is, you know? If you can't take the reflection of somebody else onto you, then there's, then there's something wrong inside that you're not accepting about yourself. That's one thing that I've learned. That if a lot of my friendships ended, most likely because a lot of people didn't accept the reflection of what that meant. Of what that of what that person meant. So the rejection of that friendship, the rejection of that relationship, the rejection of that person already shows that you're not accepting a part of yourself. Many times for me it was just that I couldn't continue a friendship if somebody's just gonna be dogging me the whole time. You know, I don't need to be to the point where everything needs to work out hundred percent, but if you're gonna just dog me the whole time, even if things don't work out or if you're just trying to be like, ha ha, I'm going to joke around with you because ha ha, you're not getting this, whether it was a friendship or anything else, then I felt like, oh, this is stupid. Why are you acting like that? Have I? And that's it. To me, that's, that's one of the worst ways you could be, to be that sarcastic sort of jealousy mixed into one. And, heck, even irritated sarcasm, let's just say it, because a lot of that is a reflection of what you don't, what you can't accept about somebody else is also what you can't accept about yourself. It may not be the exact same thing, but it's enough for you to to push down somebody else. It's enough for you to really not accept something about yourself. Because the one thing that a lot of people don't understand about that is that just because somebody thinks differently doesn't mean they're trying to make you think the same way. But I'm not saying that it's never true. But I think a lot of people don't fight the right people. They always fight the person that's easier to fight rather than fighting the person that has actually hurt them, has actually put the disapproval onto them to make them attack other people very easily, viciously like a dog. It makes it easy for them to attack people because, wait, that person disapproved of me. Now you remind me of, now I disapprove of you. So anything that I disapprove of, I'm going to act the same and viciously as my family or somebody else has done to me and disapproved of me. This is how I'm going to do it. And it's the ultimate sort of like revenge mentality in our heads. And like, if the only passion you have is your revenge and your bullying, you don't have much passion in your life. Or actually, you didn't go with your passion at least. Or you didn't fulfill your passion in what you already are doing. And you have to. You have to accomplish those passions, whether it's just gardening, whether it's just painting, whether it's something else. Maybe you didn't expect yourself in that place, but you have to get the passion in that. If you don't, all you're going to do is get revenge and seek revenge from everybody. Oh, they did that. My turn. You know, the one thing about religion that I've learned, especially Christianity and everything that's happened over the years of Catholicism and everything, is if you're just going out to hurt the least of the people, you've turned against God already. And most Catholics and Christians have because they hurt the least of the people. Just like the people in power, they hurt the meek. You know, if the meek are going to hurt the earth, there'll be nothing left of it. Because most people do it for revenge, sadly. The meek are going to be dead before, before they can inherit the earth. Because so many people seek revenge on the meek. Because they can't take it on the people that actually hurt them. Oh no, we can't do that. You know, they're too strong, they're too powerful. They're only a title, they're only a label. They're only a parent, they're only a president. They're a human like you and I. You know, and it doesn't come from revenge, violence, anything like that. It comes from actually just saying, I have to take it on the right person. I have to talk about this with the right person that actually has done this to me. I can't use somebody else to scapegoat it. And I think that's the problem. Like a lot of people say, like, it's all inner struggle, but it's not always in a struggle. A lot of times it's that people don't want to take, it, take responsibility and bring it to the person that needs to hear it. They, they just take it on anybody else that tries to talk to them about something different. Like if I was going to talk about this with somebody who doesn't fight for themselves, then they'll get mad at me because I'm telling them to fight for themselves. And I said, no, I'm not. I'm just telling you what I do. If you don't want to fight for yourself, you have that choice. But don't get mad at me because I do. Yes, I don't care if I win and I'm alone. 
Because that's what happens a lot of times because a lot of other people don't fight for themselves to win. And, but to be honest, any, anybody who hasn't uh, had their passion instilled in their lives by now, especially if they've taken on a road that's, you know, if they're an older person, like my, I think about uh, how my grandma is, you know, she loves plants, she loves animals, but it doesn't feel like she puts her passion into that. It feels like she had some other goals in her life that she didn't take. And I think that, to me, is the worst quality you could have, is to break away from your passions when you have it right there in front of you. When you have something right there in front of you that you could put your passion into. And yet, all you see is hard work. It's not hard work if you actually love doing it. And I think that's the issue, is that a lot of people don't want to prescribe themselves a good medication of thought. And to put their heart and soul into something they're doing. Instead, they just want to keep on blocking and live with the memory of what they could have done. And that's, that's sad. That's a wretched way to live. You know, the wicked witch lived better than you. And she died. Oh, what a world! Yeah, oh, what a world. You're living in it still. At least the wicked witch is dead. Damn. You know, she, may, she, she lives better because at least she put her passion into what she wanted. And how she had the authority over the lands, or at least what she thought. Okay, will you move out from your parents for me? Said the person who still lives with parents. Finding someone who will move out is the solution to them. There you go. And I think that's one of the very fraughtful kind of surround, you know, just the way that sounds. Like, move out from your parents, then we can be together. But you live with your parents still. You're asking me to move out? You live with your parents, so well, it's okay for me to. And I think that's the thing, like, with the whole gender orientation and everything that's happened recently, a lot of people say, well, I'll be with somebody the same sex and stuff with my parents, but it's opposite. And I think this is where there's an entangled web of what's happening now. We've cr Everyone thinks that everybody wants the same kind of dulcimer effect that's been happening through the years. Like, for me, for example, hey, Marcello wants to get married, doesn't he? Who said that? When you have kids, wait a minute, who said that? Did I ever say, I'm going to have kids here? No. I am a kid here. You know, I want to be in the established relationship. If, if it works out that, you know, let's say she wants to have kids and we talk about it and we figure it out that way, this is wonderful then. But don't take a characteristic of what's happened in the past to bring it now. And I think that's why a lot of people don't like the sexual orientation, this argument, the gender orientation arguments happening now. I want the right to get married. I don't want the right to get married. Heck, I'd rather just be engaged. Sounds stronger. I'm engaged with her. Ooh, damn. Sounds strong. Married? It doesn't sound so strong. It doesn't give that gumph. That word is just not strong. Engaged. I'm engaged with... You know, well, I can't say the name because I don't know who that would be. <laughs> I don't know if it'll be. <laughs> but we can. And I think that's the one thing that gives that weak hand, that weak hand to anything, is that when we try to, uh, like, say that, oh, well, I'll be together with you, but these are the rules and regulations before we do that. Expectations, again, right there. Will you move out of your parent? Will you move out from from your parents for me. Oh, jeez. If you have those kind of expectations, bye bye <laughs> Hey, will you ask me on a date? Oh, Jesus Christ. Here we go again with expectations. <laughs> if I wanted to just live up to somebody's expectations, uh, uh, I'm just going to buy him a mirror. Here you go. Happy birthday. <laughs> what is this? It's a mirror. It's all you need. You don't need me. Because <laughs> all you want me to do is live up to your expectations. I want to be with you. I don't want to just be with your expectations. Because <laughs> that means you're going to you know, break more. You're not going to just stop at this one. <laughs> hey, Marcello, move out from your parents. Oh, woohoo! Damn! What's the next expectation? Let me see the list. <laughs> this is going to be a wonderful list to accomplish in my lifetime. I already have enough expectations of my own I have to live up to. And I'm not even talking about with other people, with anything. It's myself. I can't put my expectations on you. Oh, you know, I want you to live up to my expectations. That's impossible. I want you to be yourself and be with me. That's all. That's all. And we could build a f 
grow a foundation and build expectations together. Not just build them separately and say, this is what you need to live up to. I understand doing surprise things, bringing some flowers, getting little gifts that you see and say, hey, I know my wife, I know my girlfriend would like that, I know my engaged partner will like that. <laughs> I could give it any other way, but you have to give time to those things too. You can't settle into what you settle into. If you do, then, I mean, go back to the person that you settled in with already. Because your expectations are built from what you had before, not from what you have now with the person that you haven't even been with yet. And you just expect from. I want you to live up to like my ex did. Oh, Jesus Christ, what the hell's that mean? <laughs> and I think that's one of the issues that I see every day, is this kind of thing of the, limpidless, the limpidness to not get away from something you've already escaped. I, but I got so much out of that relationship. Obviously, the other person didn't. They're not here. <laughs> hey, I'm not even there anymore, and I understand that. I left because too much possession. I said, whoa, am I looking for uh, poltergeists here? <laughs> I'm looking for ghosts, but I'm not, looking, I'm not looking to be a specimen myself. I'm looking to be a human with you. Love together with. Not built on, you know, one-sided shit of a past that's corrupted and can't begin to fix. Because you can't fix something if all you want to do is bring it up into what you have now. You can only fix something if you talk and bring it up. And not just say it one-sidedly and push it on the other person and say, this is what you have to live up to now. No thanks. I don't want to live up to something that I want to be with somebody. Hope is like a standing point that doesn't change how you are. Not a fan of hope. And I think that's what really hope is, is that it's a standing point. It's like saying that that you, this is the kind of thing that, you know, it's like having a statue of somebody that died before, that was shot before, that was killed, that was fighting for rights or something. You have a statue of them somewhere. And that kind of idealistic tendency to not break away from a standing point. I'm not a fan of hope because I think it denies self-respect. It, it instead integrally brings about depreciating qualities. Because instead of looking at something for what you have, you look at it for what you can get. That's why I don't like hope too much, because it always goes with what you can get, rather than what you already have with it. Why would I want to be with somebody if I can say, hey, I can get sex from her? Oh, wonderful! My God, what a great relationship that is. No, I want to see what I can have with it. A heart, a mind, a soul, sex, everything. It's gold. Talking, shopping, kissing, cuddling, hugging, everything. Playing video games, watching movies, listening to music, writing, whatever. Anything that I can make, it integrally brings about... I'm not saying we have to do everything together. That's, that's far from philosophy. But... To, dis to, to only keep it at a certain level says that you don't want to introduce everything. And I want to introduce everything. And you squash people's realities and you control their realities. And I think that's what really happens with a lot of what people establish as the kind of realities we live in. Like we live in the reality of society, civilization, but you squash people's realities with this stuff. You do. Not everybody's realities are built on this. Not anybody's realities are built on this. Just because we grow up in a school system that tries to establish us and get us, get us into a, you know, a, a punch shop that just goes around in circles with, you know, press punching that completely press punches into us, it doesn't always make us into what other people see fit. I don't see myself fit for this because I wasn't fit for this. And I think that's what really creates the kind of diamondology you know, living in a diamond in a rough, when I think about it, that not everybody is a diamond in the rough. I'm not in the rough. I'm not a diamond. I'm nothing. I'm only something without a standing point, without hope. I just want... I just want no reflection of what I am to deny any presence of anybody else. And that's what really this comes down to. Having human rights and human life, that's fine. But to come back to it 
and to say that you have to live up to these certain standing points or you have to live in this civilization and you have to accept the toleration of it and you have to accept the toleration that I give to it. That's your toleration of it. That's your toleration of what you don't want to see elsewhere. Because it's not just coming from us. This is coming from you saying that I can't think differently. But my human right is there. My human right before all this stuff was written. When I was a caveman. When I saw the sun go up and the sun go down and was astonished and shocked and didn't know if I was going to live anymore because the sun is gone. Because the light is gone. Not the light of God, the light of uh, day. This is the thing that we have to walk away from. Shock and therapy. Because we can't take anything as it comes. Humans are the greatest example of that. We don't accept humans as they come. We accept them as they lessen, as they run away, as we control them. And make sure if they're in fear of us, it makes it easier for us. We don't accept things without an easy way. If we have an easy way, we're here. Take care.